Hello, this is Ms. Kyler, and I am bringing you your first lecture for this British Literature course. The first one will be on the poem, The Demon Lover. As we go over the poems in this course, pay attention to who writes them and what format the poem is in. So you can see here, this one is anonymous. That means we don't know who wrote this poem. It's more of a folk ballad. So also pay attention to what kind of poem this is, and as I said, this one is a ballad. Right now, I want you to get out some your paper and your pen and start taking notes as you watch this lecture, because I'm going to be asking you questions about this poem in the quiz at the end of this lesson. First of all, it's important to know what a ballad is. A ballad, first of all, is a narrative poem consisting of quatrains. By narrative, I mean that it tells a story. Quatrains means that it's in little chunks of text that are made up of four lines each. Each stanza is made up of four lines. The ballad, the beginning is often abrupt. It starts without any warning. It just gets right into the action and the dialogue. And as we saw, see, the story is told through dialogue and action. There's very little narration going on. Mostly people talking and things happening very quickly. The language is simple or folksy. That means we just use the common parlance or the common dialect of the simple people. And of course, the theme is often tragic. It means that whatever is going to happen, you know it's not going to be something happy and jolly. Although there are some comical ballads, but this one is not one of those. The one, The Demon Lover, is going to be one of those tragic ballads. So here we are, we begin with a poem, The Demon Lover, and it starts out with some dialogue. It says, Oh, where have you been, my long, long love, this long seven years and mare? Oh, I'm come to seek my former vows you granted me before. So already we see with the mare, it's the Irish dialect, it's the common people talking. And we see this being told through dialogue. People are talking back and forth. Now, what do you see here? One, two, three, four lines. Four lines are a quatrain. So quatrain is a stanza of four lines. The next stanza begins with more dialogue. Oh, hold your tongue of your former vows, for they will breed sad strife. Oh, hold your tongue of your former vows, for I am become a wife. So we can start detecting who the different speakers are in this poem. The first speaker is someone who's coming, someone who's wondering why this other person has come from far, far away. Okay, so the first person has been waiting for this other person for a long, long time. So we can already see that the first person talking is the wife. And the second person from the title must be the demon lover speaking. So just knowing from the title, we can predict that a demon lover is not going to be an ordinary lover. And he had vowed something. It's been seven years and she's kind of given up on him. So what happens next? He turned him right and round about, and the tear blinded his eye. I would never have trodden on Irish ground if it had not been for thee. I might have had a king's daughter far, far beyond the sea. I might have had a king's daughter had it not been for love of thee. So we see this tragic theme, this sad heartbreak, sort of the sympathetic monster. We're going to see a lot of that in the Romantic era, the idea that the kind of the Frankenstein monster, this poor, sad monster that you feel sorry for, the monstrous thing. Also, we notice that there's a lot of competition. I mean, a lot of repetition that's common to ballads. Um, so here, had it not been for love of thee, is repeating if it had not been for thee in the first stanza here. If you might have had a king's daughter, your cell you had to blame, you might have taken the king's daughter, for ye kenned that I was nane. If I was to leave my husband dear and my two babes also, oh, what have you to take me to if with you I should go? And just a little uh, explanation here. Kenned means no, no, to know that you knew that I was none of that. I was not a king's daughter. 
Also, we see very common to ballads and to romantic literature, this temptation motif growing. The sort of the thing that the evil uh, entity is able to tempt the poor, naive soul away from what is right and towards what is wrong with promise of treasures and love and eternal life or something to that effect. And here again, we start seeing the temptation coming where he's promising her something. I have seven ships upon the sea. The eighth brought me to land with four and 20 bold mariners and music on every hand. So that wins her over. And right away, she's ready to say farewell to her children. She has taken up her two little babes, kissed them both cheeks and chin. Oh, fare you will, my ain two babes. I'll never see you again. She's ready to leave without a second thought that those seven ships and those mariners will really won her over. And of course, the readers at the time was would be thinking a woman's place was with her husband and family. So this woman's quick willingness to desert her children already foreshadows a tragic ending for her. She's not going to live to sing a, sing a song at the end. So what happens? She set her foot upon the ship. No mariners could she behold. The sails were the taffety and the mass of the beaten gold. She had not sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three, when Dismal drew his countenance and drumly grew his E. Okay, so bad things were already starting to predict those bad things happening, because he had promised her that there would be mariners, bold and brave. But what happens? There aren't any. So he has lied to her. But the ship is so grand and it's, so, it's made of gold, so she's not going to desert him right away. She's like, oh, maybe I'll stick with him a little longer. It's so beautiful. And again, we see that repetition continuing with a league, a league. And we're going to see that a little bit more in the next stanza. But what I want to paint you to pay attention to right here is where it says, when Dismal drew his countenance and Drumley grew his eye. So here we see a very common to romantic literature, nature and emotions go together. Nature is a reflection of the emotion. The emotion reflects nature. Drumley means dark and gloomy weather. So it's like a storm brewing. So here he is a storm brewing inside him. So the growing storm is reflected in his severe look. Again, here's that, that rep repetition again. They had not sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three, until she espied his cloven foot, and she wept right bitterly. So he has some repetition there. And the cloven hoof, of course, we know that cloven hoof, that goes along with what? A devil, a demon. So here we see his disguise kind of falling away, and she's starting to see that she made a mistake. She's weeping bitterly. And he's not very sympathetic. He just, oh, hold your tongue of your weeping, says he. Of your weeping, now let me be. I will show you how the lilies grow on the banks of Italy. So he's like, oh, shut up. And I, but I'm going to still, I'm going to, I'm going to take good care of you. So he's continuing to tempt her, but she's becoming more mastered by him. Oh, what hills are yon? Yon pleasant hills that the sun shines sweetly on. Oh, yon are the hills of heaven, he said, where ye will never win, or you will never go. Oh, what in the mountain is yon, she said, all so dreary with frost and snow. Oh, yon is the mountain of hell, he cries, where you and I will go. So this sounds pretty bad. She has forsaken her chance at heaven. We knew that already when she deserted her husband and her children. So what? where will she go? Hell, you, know, you, you reap what you sow. And finally, the tragedy comes to pass. He struck up the tapmost with his hand. So he strikes the mast with his hand, the foremast with his knee. So he must be pretty huge. I, I, you can imagine that he's probably grown really, really huge, like a big scary monster. And he's just, with one flick of his hand, he can get rid of the mast. And one move of his knee, he can get rid of the other. He break that gallant ship in twain and sank her in the sea. So there they go. And the readers at the time would see this as a predictable punishment for a woman who would not stay home with her children and her husband. So they'd say, well, she got what she deserved. 
although also we can see it as kind of a very dramatic, sympathetic story. We see the monster as sympathetic, and the woman, we can kind of see why she'd want to go and see something new, something different, and someone who seems to love her so much. Yet, of course, she should have stayed home with her family, according to the thought at the time. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and make sure you watch it again if you did not catch all the notes. Thanks. Bye.